Thanksgiving. And I'd like to welcome you all to our Travel Friday this week, where Lou will be taking us on a trip to Ukraine. So make sure you stay on at the end so you can uh, participate in our trivia and potentially win an iPad accessory prize today. Uh, mm -hmm. Other than that, Lou, the floor is yours. Again, thanks so much for coming on and presenting, as always. Oh, great. Well, thank you, folks. Hey, I got to apologize. I got very involved in the grant development uh project and i didn't have as much time to prepare today as i normally do so i i apologize in advance the trivia especially is a little weak this week uh but just bear with me if you don't mind okay let's get this show on the road so let me share my screen just a moment okay so we are going to start off where we always start at the Department of Aging and Community Living. And we are going to walk over to Union Station, which is right here. And then we're gonna go to Ukraine. So how, how do we get to Ukraine nowadays? Anybody know how if we're gonna go to Ukraine? How are we gonna get there? Fly, go we'll fly there. Yeah, but I... I, I if anybody wants to Google it, how in the world would you fly to Ukraine nowadays? So we're going to take off from D.C. after going to Dallas Airport, and we're going to head. We're going to head. What direction will we head to get to Ukraine? East, west, north, or south? Anybody? Northwest. Well, we're going to actually head east. 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 Good guess, though. You're going to head east. So we're going to go over this big, huge Atlantic Ocean right here. Big, huge Atlantic Ocean. And then we're going to fly over Spain, which you've already been to. We're going to fly over France, which we've already visited. We're going to go over Switzerland, which we've already visited, over Germany. And I think to, I think to get to uh, Ukraine, we probably have to land in Poland. We've already been to Poland, so we know all these countries. The reason I say that is because here's the here's Ukraine right here. Y'all see it? And then here's the border with Poland right here. And I know we know that Poland is providing a lot of support to Ukraine during this war. Anybody remember the city here, Lviv? Anybody remember that on the news? They're saying that that's sort of a safe haven during this wartime and. Ukraine. So we probably start, we probably travel by land from Warsaw, get in a truck, cross the border, spend some time in Lviv. But we really want to get out to Kiev because that's the cultural center of the Ukraine. Now, do we want to go there in today's day and age? I'm not so sure about that. But that's where it is. And then the frontier where all the conflict is happening is right along here. And guess what country this is over here? Russia. Russia, right. So look at that long border that they share with Russia. Pretty long. And do you remember you're hearing about how during the Olympics, right at the Sochi Olympics, I think, they invaded Crimea? So this is the Crimean Peninsula down here in the middle of the Black Sea. Here's the Crimean Peninsula. And they and the, Russia just went ahead and swiped the Crimean Peninsula from Ukraine way back in what time you might remember the 2016 somewhere around there around the time of the Sochi Olympics. And so Ukraine no longer really controls that, and you can sort of see on the map that they got this dotted line in here. See that dotted line? That sort of means that we're not sure we're not sure whose border this is. That's what that says. Could be, could be Russia, could be Ukraine, disputed territory. Russia is claiming that territory. So Russia is holding this territory right now, right? Right, Tom? Right. Yeah. Okay. So let's get this show on the road. So I'm going to start a, I'm going to start the meeting. 
Oh, Lou, while you pull up the video, is that why um, we actually talked about the booking.com app today? When I try to go to K Kiviv, um, they said there were no flights available. So I should have been trying to go to Lviv, right? Maybe I would have found what? a flight there, but there was zero flights to Kiviv. Um, and that's because of what's going on. So that makes complete sense, right? Well, why don't you see if Lviv, check it, L-V-I-V, -V, Google it and see what you see there. In Lviv, uh, but I think that the only way to get there is through Warsaw. I think that's. I think you have to travel by ground. I don't think there's any flights going anywhere into the Ukraine at this point. So, Alex, why don't you take a moment and Google that while I'm queuing up the next video? And I do apologize. I really had a not a lot of time to put this together, but I think I got some pretty good videos. I actually want to spend a lot of time today, if you don't mind, on Ukrainian history. Because there's a lot, this is, this is important for all of us to know, given the amount of support the United States is providing to Ukraine and the incredibly tight connection we have right now with Ukraine. So I think we need to know a lot, as much as, more than any other time maybe, about the history of Ukraine. Oh, uh, Lou, I, I looked for Lviv, I looked for Kiviv. Uh, there are no flights that are going from D.C. to there because I guess what's of what's going on. So it made sense that I couldn't get any results. Um, it sure does. It sure does. All right. Well, I'm going to I'm going to play this right now. So here we go. Um, Lou, I think you may need to turn uh, stop sharing your screen and turning on the sound. Oh, I think I forgot that. Boy, I'm making a lot of mistakes today. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> let's 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 see if I can stop the share. And let's share it again. And this time I'm gonna share the sound. Okay, and I'll start it all over. So let's all listen to this closely. It's a long clip, it's 18 minutes, but it's but this is the best one that I found. We really all gotta know this. Here we go. And Russia have been strained since the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. Ukraine was known as the breadbasket of Soviet Russia and has remained politically, militarily and economically important to Russia ever since. Precisely why there is a dispute over the sovereignty of so Ukraine so to go back to the video. question rooted in the region's history. It's a story more than a thousand years in the making. For much of the story, Ukraine did not exist, at least not as an independent sovereign state, so the name Ukraine will be used here to help identify the region around Kyiv that was so central to the story. Crimea is an important part of the story too, and its history forms part of the story of the relationship between Russia and Ukraine. Today, Kiev is the capital city of Ukraine. A millennium ago, it was the heart of what is known as the Kievan Rus state. Between the 8th and 11th centuries, Norse traders sailed the river routes from the Baltic to the Black Sea. Predominantly Swedish in origin, they found their way to the Byzantine Empire and even attacked Persia from the Caspian Sea in the 10th century. Around what is now Kiev, these traders began to settle. They were referred to as the Rus, which seems to have its origins in the word for men who row, since they were so closely associated with the rivers and their ships. Merging with Slavic, Baltic and Finnic tribes, they became known as the Kievan Rus. The Rus tribes are the ancestors of those who still bear their name today, the Russian and Belarusian people, as well as those of Ukraine. Kiev was referred to by the 12th century as the mother of Rus cities, effectively denoting it as the capital of the Kievan Rus state. The rulers of the region were styled Grand Princes of Kiev. The association of Kiev with the early heritage of the Rus as the root of the Russian people mean the city has a hold over the collective imaginations of those beyond modern Ukraine. It was important to the birth of Russia, but now lies beyond its borders. This thousand-year-old connection is the beginning of an explanation of the present tensions. People are always willing to fight 
over places that exert a pull on them. In 1223, the irresistible expansion of the Mongol horde reached the Kievan Rus state. On the 31st of May, the Battle of the Kolka River was fought, resulting in a decisive Mongol victory. Although the horde left the region after the battle, the damage had been done, and they would return in 1237 to complete the conquering of Kievan Rus. This began the breakup of the Rus states and left the region under the dominion of the Golden Horde, in some places for centuries more. It was during this period that the Grand Duchy of Moscow began to rise, eventually becoming the heart of what is now Russia and providing a new focal point for the Rus people. As the control of the Golden Horde slipped, Ukraine was absorbed into the Grand Duchy of Lithuania and then the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth for a time. Cossacks, who were most closely linked with Kiev and Ukraine, began to resist the control of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and rebelled in favour of joining Russia. Under the Grand Princes of Moscow since 1371, Russia had been slowly forming from disparate states. The process was completed in the 1520s under Vasily III. A Russian state appealed to the Rus peoples of Ukraine and exerted a pull on their allegiance. In 1654, the Cossacks signed the Treaty of Pereyaslav with Tsar Alexis, the second Tsar of the Romanov dynasty. This saw the Cossacks break with the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and formally offer their allegiance to the Russian Tsar. The USSR would later style this as an act that reunified Ukraine with Russia, bringing all of the Rus people together under a Tsar. Crimea, which had been a Khanate, had been part of the Ottoman Empire, but following war between the Ottoman and Russian empires, Crimea had been briefly independent before being annexed by Russia on the orders of Catherine the Great in 1783, a move that was not resisted by the Tatars of the Crimea and which was recognised formally by the Ottoman Empire. During the 19th century, a Ukrainian identity began to emerge more fully, closely linked to the region's Cossack heritage. By this stage, Russians considered Ukrainians, as well as Belarusians, as ethnically Russian, but referred to both groups as Little Russians. In 1804, the growing separatist movement in Ukraine led to a ban on teaching the Ukrainian language in schools in an effort to eradicate the threat of a breakup of the Russian Empire. From October 1853 to February 1856, the region was rocked by the Crimean War. The Russian Empire fought a coalition of the Ottoman Empire, France and the United Kingdom. The conflict saw the battles of Alma and Balaclava, the charge of the Light Brigade, and Florence Nightingale's experiences that led to the professionalisation of nursing, before being resolved by the Siege of Sevastopol, a critically important naval base on the Black Sea. The Russian Empire lost the Crimean War, and the Treaty of Paris, signed on the 30th of March 1856, saw Russia forbidden from basing naval forces in the Black Sea. The embarrassment felt by the Russian Empire led to internal reforms and modernisation in an effort not to be left behind other European powers. Ukraine remained unsettled too, and in 1876, the ban on teaching the Ukrainian language put in place in 1804 was extended to prohibit the publication or importation of books, performances of plays and the delivery of lectures in the Ukrainian language. In 1917, in the wake of the Russian Revolution, Ukraine was briefly an independent nation, but was soon to become part of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. The USSR, that would be a dominant force in world politics for most of the rest of the 20th century, was about to be born. In 1922, Russia and Ukraine were two of the signatories to the founding document of the USSR. With its wide, sweeping, fertile plains, 
it would become known as the breadbasket of the Soviet Union, providing grain and food that made it an invaluable part of the USSR. That fact only made what happened next all the more shocking. The Holodomor was a state-sponsored famine created by Stalin's government in the Ukraine as an act of genocide. Crops were seized and sold to overseas markets to fund Stalin's plans. Animals, including pets, were removed. Soviet soldiers ensured whatever remained was kept from the population, resulting in the deliberate starvation and deaths of up to four million Ukrainians. During the Second World War, Germany invaded Ukraine, moving across the border on the 22nd of June 1941 and completing their takeover by November. Four million Ukrainians were evacuated east. The Nazis encouraged collaboration by appearing to back an independent Ukrainian state, only to renege on that promise once in control. Between 1941 and 1944, around 1.5 million Jews living in Ukraine were killed by Nazi forces. After the USSR was victorious at the Battle of Stalingrad in early 1943, the counter-offensive moved across Ukraine, retaking Kiev in November that year. The fight for Western Ukraine was hard and bloody until Nazi Germany was driven out altogether by the end of October 1944. Ukraine lost between five and seven million lives during World War II. A famine in 1946 to seven claimed around a million more lives and pre-war levels of food production would not be restored until the 1960s. In 1954, the USSR transferred control of Crimea to Soviet Ukraine. There was perhaps a feeling that with the USSR strong, it made little difference which Soviet state administered the territory, but the move stored up problems for a future in which the Soviet Union no longer existed. On the 26th of April 1986, the Chernobyl nuclear disaster took place in Ukraine. During a test procedure on reactor number four, a power decrease made the reactor unstable. The core went into meltdown, the subsequent explosion destroying the building. Chernobyl remains one of only two nuclear disasters to be rated at the highest level, alongside the 2011 Fukushima disaster. The explosion at Chernobyl caused ongoing health issues for the surrounding area, and the Chernobyl exclusion zone covered more than two and a half thousand square kilometers. Chernobyl has been pointed to as one of the contributing causes of the collapse of the USSR. It shook faith in the Soviet government, and Mikhail Gorbachev, the last Secretary General of the Soviet Union, said it was a turning point that opened the possibility of much greater freedom of expression to the point that the system as we knew it could no longer continue. Five years later, in 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed. Ukraine was one of the signatories of the document disbanding the Union, which meant that it was, at least on the surface, being recognised as an independent state. In the same year, a referendum and election were held. The referendum question was, do you support an act of declaration of independence of Ukraine? Over 84% of the population took part, almost 32 million people, voting 92.3% in favour of an independent Ukraine. In the presidential election, six candidates ran, all backing the Yes campaign, and Leonid Kravchuk was elected the first president of Ukraine. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, Ukraine became the third largest holder of nuclear weapons in the world. Although it possessed the warheads and the capacity to make more, the software that controlled them was in Russian hands. Russia and Western states agreed to recognise and respect Ukraine's independent, sovereign status in return for handing most of its nuclear capacity over to Russia. In 1994, the Budapest Memorandum on Security Assurances provided for the destruction of the remaining warheads.
In 2004, the Orange Revolution took place amid protests about a corrupt presidential election. Protests in Kiev and general strikes across the country eventually saw the election result overturned and Viktor Yanukovych was replaced by Viktor Yushchenko. The Kiev Appellate Court gave a decision on the 13th of January 2010 that posthumously convicted Stalin, Ganovich, Molotov and Ukrainian leaders Kozie and Chuba, as well as others, of genocide against the Ukrainian people during the Holodomor of the 1930s. The decision served to reinforce a sense of Ukrainian identity and distance the country further from Russia. 2014 saw a great deal of unrest in Ukraine. The Revolution of Dignity, also known as the Maidan Revolution, erupted as a result of President Yanukovych's refusal to sign a document that would create a political association and free trade agreement with the EU. 130 people were killed, including 18 police officers, and the revolution led to early presidential elections. In the same year, a pro-Russian uprising in eastern Ukraine, which Russia is suspected of sponsoring and which has been termed as an invasion, saw fighting begin in the Donbass region, which continues at present. The move served to solidify the sense of Ukrainian national identity and independence from Moscow. Also in 2014, Russia annexed Crimea, which had been part of Ukraine since 1954. The reasons for this are complex. Crimea remains militarily and strategically important, with ports on the Black Sea. It's also a place regarded with fondness dating back to the Soviet era, when it was a holiday destination. Today, Russia remains in control of Crimea, but that control is not recognised by the international community. Ukraine remains in a state of unrest that dates back to 2014. It was exacerbated in 2019 by a change to the constitution of Ukraine that enshrined closer links with both NATO and the EU. This step confirmed Russian fears about the influence of the US and Western European states on its borders, increasing tensions in the region. On the 1st of July 2021, the law was changed in Ukraine to allow the sale of farmland for the first time in 20 years. The original ban had been put in place to prevent the same sort of takeover by an oligarchy that Russia had seen in the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union. For Ukraine and Ukrainians, it created a huge opportunity to fill a gap in global food supply chains caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. At the beginning of 2022, Ukraine was the biggest exporter of sunflower oil in the world, the fourth largest shipper of corn, delivering grain to countries from Morocco to Bangladesh and Indonesia. Corn yields were a third lower than the US and a quarter below EU levels, leaving room for improvement. Rich Gulf states were showing particular interest in supplies of food from Ukraine. All of this meant that the former breadbasket of the Soviet Union saw its stock rise sharply, bringing with it unwelcome consequences. The relationship between Russia and Ukraine has always been complex and rooted in an often shared history. Russia has long viewed Ukraine as a Russian province rather than a sovereign state. To counterbalance this perceived attack on its independence, Ukraine has sought closer ties with the West, both with NATO and the EU, which Russia in turn viewed as a threat to its own security. Beyond a shared heritage, a sentimental connection to the Rus states that once centred on Kyiv, Ukraine remains important to Russia. It's been a buffer between Russia and Western states, and fears that it will join NATO and the EU are perceived as a threat to Russia. As a country with an economy based on food production, it remains economically as well as strategically important. Russia's concerns about who is in control of Ukraine often leave little room in its thinking for an independent, sovereign state. To some extent, Ukraine in 2022 became to Russia 
what Cuba was to the US in the 1960s. The Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962 saw global nuclear war narrowly averted. A sustainable, long-term solution to the relationship between Ukraine and Russia that all parties can live with may be hard to find, but it's required to avoid a repeat of the worst aspects of 20th century history. Wow, folks, I thought that was fantastic. What do you all think? That was really interesting. I remember when um, we were in school and they started some of that stuff going on over there. Um, and it was, and of course, as young people, you're not uh, concentrating on what what it means, but Ukraine has a lot of uh, gas and wheat. In fact, they're one of the most... Uh, countries that that um, give wheat away or sell wheat to a lot of other countries so um, that's why Russia want, Russia wants that they would like to do away with the Ukrainian people well thanks for that perspective uh, anybody else I I didn't know that they were the largest um, sunflower oil pr production mm -hmm. in Ukraine. Yeah. I remember in the news when, when um, uh, Russia annexed Crimea. And I remember mm -hmm. the discussion was that n nobody stopped them. The West didn't stop them. The EU didn't stop Russia from annexing Crimea. And now they want to annex uh, Ukraine. And, I, uh, and that's why they're fighting over there because if they allow Russia to annex Ukraine, then they won't stop there. They'll go to Poland, mm -hmm. and 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 uh, that's that's what the war is all about now. Mm -hmm. But it seems like it seems like they'll make some by next year. I mean, I'm listening to the news, and it's, it's like 2025 or 2026. They'll make some kind of a uh, deal where Russia will get some of Ukraine, the part that they're already occupying i forgot the name of it but uh and then and then ukraine will keep the rest now that's what i'm hearing in the news mm -hmm. and excellent yeah good points all good points. yeah well this is will the bud it's surprising to me that ukraine is the largest they say the largest country in europe so how in the world uh you know that, that I, well i can see why russia would want to take them over okay but how they are just allowed to do that to to the largest country in the world, and it just it's, it's mind blowing. Russia, because they're the bread basket of the USSR too. That's my point. Yes, <laughs> that's my point. But they made a deal with Ukraine back in I, I forgot that they gave the year in this presentation. They made a deal with Ukraine that if Ukraine gave up its nuclear heads that the, it, it could be a free country. So they gave them up. Now mm. they're going back on the deal. Mm. Right. Yeah. And how they're being allowed to do that. That's right. Nuclear war by now if they hadn't been if they hadn't given those weapons up, that'd really be scary. Yeah, yeah that, would be uh, scary. That, that, that would be, that would be really scary. That would. <laughs> they, they have the third largest um, nuclear weapon, right? But I guess Russia probably wouldn't have invaded if they had nuclear weapons either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They kept they, their weapons. Mm -hmm. They, they signed that so they went That's back where we live the in. They reneged. Yes. But, but, I was surprised how it, how interwoven the history was, back and forth, forth and back, for how many yeah. years, for like a yeah. thousand years. Yes. A thousand years, just yeah. always going back and forth. In that, in that they're only an independent country for a few short times in history. Yeah. Uh, yes, which means all them people are related. And, uh, yeah, you know. they're related. Yeah, all the people are related. Yeah. I think they all they all have Russian roots. Yes. They have Russian roots. 
Mm-hmm. But um, but they can't renege on that deal. They got them to give away. They'll give up their weapons. No, I don't blame Ukraine from fighting, but I do believe they'll make a deal with Russia and give them the the, the territory oh, yeah. that they already have. Russia need to leave them alone. Yeah, they need to leave them alone. But <laughs> yeah, they, Russia need to really leave a whole lot of folks alone. That, yeah, that, Russia is just too <laughs> too aggressive. Yes, but, yeah. That's your- wants to become the USSR. They want they want to own all the Russian countries. Yeah, yeah. yeah they, it, want, it, they want to be the USSR again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they're not going to stop at Ukraine. That's why we are fighting. We have to help Ukraine. We, we can't let Russia have Ukraine. Yeah. We have to come to some kind of deal because we can't keep giving them money endlessly because we don't mm-hmm. have it to give. Mm. We, at some point, we we have to stop giving. So they have to make a deal. Mm-hmm. They have to make a deal. Mm-hmm. Well, folks, this is a great discussion, but I'm afraid we're going to run out of time for trivia. Okay. If we, All right. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. So here's the top ten places in Ukraine. Now, this video was taken before the war started. Thank gosh. And so you're going to see what it used to look like. Probably half these sites don't even exist anymore. What's up guys, my name is Ryan and I want to show you some of my favorite places in the beautiful country of Ukraine. So here's my Ukraine wow. 10. Yeah, we see it. Ukraine is home to some of the most scenic landscapes. From medieval castles to the towering Carpathian mountains, Ukraine has so many hidden gems waiting to be explored. Let's start this video off in the beautiful city of Kiev. Located in north central Ukraine, Kiev is a sight to see. It's home to nearly 3 million residents, making it the seventh most populous city in all of Europe. It's believed to have been founded around the 5th century as a Slavic settlement that grew as it was positioned on the trade route between Scandinavia and Constantinople. Today, Kiev is an important cultural, scientific, and industrial center of Eastern Europe. I'm amazed by how beautiful the city is, especially during the summertime. I mean, it's just so great and inviting. One of the most famous places in the wow. city Kiev Monastery of the Caves. It's an Orthodox Christian monastery and it began as a cave in the year 1051. Today it's an active monastery with over 100 monks and it's named one of the seven wonders of Ukraine. Right next to the monastery is the Motherland Monument. It's a 203 feet tall stainless steel statue that was completed in 1881. It's just such a unique statue that towers over the city. I mean, Kiev is such a spectacular place. I hope you all can visit one day. Afterwards, we're going to head over to the infamous Chernobyl. Now, located about a two hour drive from Kiev, right near the border of Belarus, Chernobyl is where a tragic nuclear accident took place in 1986, where a failed safety test was a reactor to explode, which resulted in the worst nuclear disaster in all of history. If you want to binge watch a great show, I highly recommend watching HBO's Chernobyl series. In 2011, Chernobyl was open to the public. Today, you can take a guided tour and witness the deserted area around Chernobyl. The town of Pryat will give you a true sense of what a post-apocalyptic world would look like. Deserted buildings and an abandoned amusement park give you a sense of eeriness and wonder as you imagine what it must have been like to live here before the catastrophe. Just such an insane place. Now afterwards, we're going to visit the Carpathian Mountains. Now I have to say this is one of my favorite regions in the country. Located on the western part of Ukraine, the Carpathians are a massive mountain range that also passes through Slovakia, Poland, Hungary, and Romania. The mountains are home to wildlife such as brown bears, wolves, and lynx. While the Carpathians aren't as jagged as other European mountains such as the Alps, the Carpathians have their own beauty with giant rolling mountains covered in beautiful dense forest. During the winter time, the Carpathians are a perfect place to go skiing. I think one of the best times to visit these mountains is during the fall when they are covered in the most beautiful colors. I mean, if I could live anywhere in Ukraine, I'd probably shack up in a cabin somewhere in these incredible mountains. Now afterwards, we're going to visit the Polano Castle. Now located on the western side of the Carpathian Mountains, near the Slovakia and Hungarian borders, the Palinok Castle is a uniquely shaped medieval fortress that is built upon a volcanic hill that overlooks the city. The exact date of the castle's founding is unknown, but it was first mentioned in 11th century. 
Today, built from the 14th to 17th centuries, the fortress was divided between the lower, middle, and upper castles. For I would have felt sick <laughs> the times. If you visit, you can take a tour of the castle and wonder what it must have been like to live here during the Middle Ages. Now after, we're going to visit the city of Lviv, located in western Ukraine, about 70 miles from the border of Poland. One thing interesting about Lviv is that it's home to 1,500 cafes, making it the highest number of cafes per capita in the world. I mean, I just love the architecture throughout the city. There's so many beautiful churches and other historical buildings. Buildings. The roofs are just so colorful and unique. Now outside of Lviv, the countryside offers some unique castles such as Zolochiv and Pithersi castles. I mean just such a stunning place. Now after we're going to head over to the Pochaiv Lavra Monastery. Now located about a two hours drive outside of Lviv, the monastery is the second largest in the country after the one in Kiev. I mean just absolutely enormous. The monastery dates back to 1527 and today it's one of the most important religious places in West in Ukraine. I just love the gold plated domes contrasted with the green roofs. No, it's just such a fascinating place. After, we're going to head to the city of Ivano Frankivsk. Located at the foothills of the Carpathian Mountains, Ivano Frankivsk is a beautiful city. It began as a Polish fortress in the 17th century and grew to one of the most prominent cities in the region. I love how it has a lake in the center of it. I mean, a perfect place to enjoy on a hot summer day. The central square is another great spot with the unique uniquely designed Ratusha building in the center. Afterwards, we're going to head over to Chernovitsi. Now located about a two hours drive from Ivano Frankivsk, Chernovitsi is one of Ukraine's most important educational and architectural sites. The Chernovitsi National University is one of the highlights of the city. It was founded back in 1875 and it's one of Ukraine's most beautiful and prominent universities. Another cool nearby place is Bakota. Located on the Dniester River, about a two hours drive from Chernovitsi, it's a beautiful area with a massive bay and rocky cliffs that overlook the river. It is believed the area was settled around the 12th century by creepy monks who left behind cave monasteries filled with ancient frescoes and paintings. Overall, I think this is just a beautiful area in western Ukraine. Another stunning nearby spot is the Kamyanets Badilsky Castle. I think this is one of the most impressive medieval castles in all of Ukraine. Located just an hour's drive outside Bakota, it is perched perfectly on a peninsula as it overlooks the town. It is believed that the castle was built sometime around the 13th century. Due to its strategic position, the fortress was subject to many foreign invaders throughout the years. I just love the towers with their pointy roofs. It kind of reminds me of a mini Hogwarts. You can walk around the castle and marvel at its medieval stone walls. The cobblestone bridge leading up to the castle frames it perfectly. It's just such a cool place. I hope you can check out if you're in western Ukraine. Now afterwards, we're going to visit Crimea. The status of Crimea is currently disputed. In 2014, it was annexed by Russia, but Crimea is still internationally recognized as being part of Ukraine by the United Nations and other countries. I mean, politics aside, I just want to show the beauty of Crimea because it's just such a beautiful place that deserves recognition. Crimea is located on a peninsula on the northern coast of the Black Sea. The coastline reminds me a lot of the Mediterranean with its rocky coast and vineyards. One of the most beautiful towns on the coast is Simez. It's a great resort town with striking rock formations that line the coast. Another impressive place is the Genoese Fortress. It's located in the small town of Sudak. The medieval fortress was built by the Italian Republic of Genoa and was completed in 1469. It consists of an impressive stone wall with over 14 towers. I mean, Crimea is just such a beautiful place. Now for our final destination, we're going to head over to the seaside town of Odessa. Now located about a six hour drive from Kiev, Odessa is a port city located near the north shore of the Black Sea. Today it's Ukraine's third most populous city and a popular tourism location. It's a great place to come in the summer and bathe in the Black Sea. One of the cool spots in Odessa is the Ackerman Fortress. It's unclear when the fortress was founded but it was believed to have been established in the 13th century by the Republic of Genoa. Odessa is just such a beautiful and historical city that you gotta visit if you're in Ukraine. Well that is it for my Ukraine top 10. Let me know where your favorite place is in Ukraine in the comments below. I also All right. Well that's actually pretty good. What do you all think? I can't even imagine what those places look like today. I'm really sad about that. Beautiful, yeah.
Yeah, it was beautiful. Yeah, I was beautiful. just discussing that with right. my age. We were, we were just saying that just the shame that so many beautiful architectural and and natural um, mm -hmm. have just been destroyed. And so mercy. sad. So sad. Wait. Okay. For for all of you who got the guts to go out there, I can't I can't let you go without playing this last video here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, but play. Indirect fire isn't fun, but you know what is fun? Living, being alive. So I'm going to give you the best tips and tricks. Actually, just one, but I think it's really important. It's something I was never taught in the Marine Corps. So let's get into it. When you are being targeted by indirect fire, whether it's a tank, artillery, mortar, grad, whatever it is, most of the time, if it is targeting you, you're going to be able to hear two sounds before it even hits you. So let me play this clip of when I was riding into Meek Live on my first combat operation. I had no idea what artillery sounded like. Tell me what you think. Yeah, let's dismount. Hey, get to cover, right? Let's fucking go. Go right! Sounds a little confusing, right? A lot of sounds, a lot of booms. But guess what? I'm not confused anymore. So if you're wondering how to give yourself the best chance under an artillery barrage, here is the tip. You can hear two distinct sounds before the last boom. The first sound is the actual projectile launching from the cannon. You can hear the cannon blast. You can hear the gunshot, right? The second sound is uh, kind of weird, but it's a whistle. Go! Yeah, it's giving you a little love tap. It's saying, hey, I'm coming. I want to kill you, but I'm coming. At that point, you already have two sounds that have given you the chance to go to cover, get into the prone, whatever you want. And the last boom is the is the one that I hope that you are listening for the other sound. If the artillery is not firing at you, you're not going to hear, usually, you're not going to hear the cannon blast. If it's pointing towards you, you're going to hear the cannon blast. And if it's if it's going over your head, or if it's coming at you, you're going to hear the, you're going to hear the whistle. Go, 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 go. So that's the best advice I can give you. Alright. What's going on, Ivan? Man. Yeah, you know, there's obviously some more stuff, but, yeah. Uh, stay strong. Peace. All right. Well, that was a that was an important video. That's cray cray. Yeah. No, I don't like that stuff. <laughs> that, was that, some really good, crazy. that was some that good was advice crazy. they gave. That was some good advice. All right, folks. Well, now we're almost at ten minutes to the hour, so it's our favorite time of day here. I do apologize that my my preparation's been so poor, but uh, Alex, if you can tee everybody up, that would be great. Yep. Thank you so much, Lou, for your session today. Again, Lou does trivia every time we have our travel call. So if you'd like to answer one of Lou's questions, you must raise your hand in Zoom if you would like to show your response. Again, once you answer a trivia question correct, you're in the running for an iPad accessory prize. So again, I want everyone in Zoom to please raise their hand. You can hit more at the top right and then tap on raise hand. Or if your toolbar is at the bottom, you can tap on reactions and then tap on raise hand okay so again let's see if we can get as many hands again uh, we'd love to hear from as many folks as possible again you're in the running for an ipad accessory prize today just by coming on and uh getting some trivia questions correct okay again google is your friend so i appreciate that we got a couple of hands today so thank you again you all can hit lower at the bottom don't forget to lower your hand and meet yourself again you must provide all parts of the uh, answer to receive um, a chance of winning an iPad accessory prize, okay? Thank you all so much. And Lou, uh, the floor is yours once again. Thank you, Alex. Okay, here's the first question. Something is wrong with this picture of Ukraine. What's wrong with it? Okay, again, you must raise your hand if you would like to answer. What is wrong with this picture? Okay, um, Miss Terry, what do you say? You have to hit unmute in the middle, Miss Terry. 
I think it's the wrong flag. Oh, that's good. Okay, yeah, that's true. <laughs> but but uh, but uh, well, let's give we'll give it to you. That's actually, I think, the Chilean flag, and this is, mm -hmm. I think, the Argentinian flag, or mm -hmm. vice versa. And that's actually South America right there. It's not Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Miss Terry. Good job. Good job. You're in the running for a prize today. Okay, <laughs> next one. And don't forget to lower your hand and mute yourself. Thank you so much. Okay. Ukraine is the second largest country in Europe in terms of total area, spanning 603 uh, square kilometers. Uh, that's, that must be thousands, 603,000 square kilometers or square miles, twice the size of Italy. But what's the largest country in Europe? Okay, uh, Ms. Wilder, what do you say? Believe. I thought you said the Ukraine. Ukraine was the largest country in Europe. But this is no, the... it's actually not. It's Ukraine is not the largest. It's the second oh, largest. The second country. largest. Okay. Thank second largest. Holder. Uh, next up is Mr. Harold. What do you say? Russia is the largest country in Europe. Good job. Good job. Russia is the okay. largest country in Europe by land area with three point nine million square kilometers of land. This makes it almost five times larger than Ukraine, the set, which is the second largest country. Okay, good job, good job. Okay, next one. This is a little harder. How many UNESCO World Heritage Sites are there in Ukraine? Keep in mind a UNESCO World Heritage Site, these are the most significant sites in the whole world. And the United Nations mapped them. And every country has some of them. But Ukraine has a certain amount of them. How many does it have? And please raise your hand if you'd like to answer. Again, thank you, Mr. Harold. Make sure you keep your hand up. Um, and what do you say? Thanks so much for sharing. What is your answer? Eight. Now, how did you get that answer? That's close, and maybe my information is outdated. Who? Where did you find that? On Google. It says eight? Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm going to go with that. Where I said it says UNESCO World Heritage Sites designates some of the most important parts of the world, and Ukraine is lucky to have to have seven. But I wouldn't be surprised if this set website is a little outdated. So I think you're right. Uh, all right, good job. Appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good job. It is outdated, Alex. I, I'm not sure, Lou. Okay, I believe it is. I believe that my information is outdated. Okay, next question. Here's a hard one. What famous holiday pastime originated in Ukraine? Sorry about the misspelling. What famous holiday pastime? You all have done this. All of you. Any takers. Okay. Uh, Janelle and Bridget, what do you say? Chris Christmas. No, it's a good guess. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, Gerilyn, what do you say? I was thinking going to the beach. No, no, that's a good guess. Okay. A holiday pastime. Okay. Uh let's see. Okay, Miss Doris, what do you say? I'm gonna say Thanksgiving. No, no, not Thanksgiving. That's a good guess though. Okay. Okay. Uh Hmm. Miss uh, Hill, what do you say? What do, what do you think the answer is? Um, this is a funny name. Havana Cupola Day. No, no. This is a this is a world famous holiday. Uh, pa it's a pastime. Like you know, like Christmas tree was came out of Germany or something. This is something similar, but for a different holiday. It is practiced worldwide, but it came from Ukraine. I'll give you a hint. The holiday happens in the springtime. And any takers, okay. Uh, Mr. Thomas, what do you say? I think it's Easter and it's the Easter egg that they uh, oh, well. yay! Good, <laughs> job. Good job. Mr. Thomas. Thank you so much. Good job. Good job. I didn't, I didn't know that. So that's something new I learned today as well. Isn't that wild? <laughs>
Okay, we're getting towards the end. I don't have a lightning round today, but uh, I just ran out of time. Getting towards the end. Ukraine is the world's largest producer of what kind of seed? Okay. Oh, yep. Yeah, uh, Gerilyn, what do you say? Poppy uh, seed. And Alex, my computer is going to shut down. I got to grab the power cord. No, that's not it. Keep guessing. Uh huh. Um. um yes. Uh, let's see. Let's see. We will be coming back with this in a second. Uh, let me see. Uh, Brenda, what do you say? Uh, I'm gonna guess and say sunflower. Uh, okay. Well. No. Nope. Let, let me. Uh. Let, let's yes. keep. Yes. Okay, you you heard that, Lou? <laughs> heard it. Okay. Did you hear that, Lou? I heard it. Yep. Sunflower. Good job, Brenda. <laughs> good, good, good. Thank you so much. All right, Alex, that's it. That, I think that's the end of the deck. Let me make sure. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, thank that's you. it. That's it. Yep. Thank you so much, Lou, for the questions. I really appreciate it. And good I'm job. Sorry they weren't as good this week, but I'll okay. work on it next they week. They were they were really good, Lou. Thanks so much for your questions. I learned a lot. And I know you all did as well. So um, as always, we have our trivia um prize. So one of you that answered a trivia question correctly are in the running for a prize today. So we have uh Miss Terry, Mr. Harrow, Miss Ann, Mr. Thomas, and Miss Brenda today is getting a uh, trivia question correct. Good job. Appreciate it. And let's see who wins the prize. Let's see who wins. Okay, Brenda, you got it. Let's see. So today um, you won a Bluetooth keyboard. So congratulations. Thank you. No problem, Brenda. Thank you so much for participating. Good job on that question. <laughs> well, again, thank you all so much for attending our presentation and our trip with Lou today. Uh, let's all say thank you to Lou um, for today's presentation, and I will see you all at 1.30 for our module. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. Have a good afternoon. Bye. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was very interesting. Very interesting, yes. Have a good rest of your day. See you soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.